This podcast is sponsored by Bigger Brains, online training that won't bore you to tears. Expand the minds of your workforce at getbiggerbrains.com. Welcome to Permission to Speak, the video blog and podcast that loiters at the intersection of leaders who want their people to speak up, technology that facilitates connections, and results that serve our higher purpose. Now, here's your host, Kelly Vandiver. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Kelly Vandiver, and my special guest today is Jennifer Conweiler. Jennifer B. Conweiler, PhD, CSP, is a global speaker and best selling author hailed as the champion of introverts. <laughs> <laughs> Her books, The Introverted Leader, Quiet Influence, and The Genius of Opposites, have been translated into 16 languages. Jennifer has spoken at hundreds of organizations, including GE, NASA, and the U.S. Embassy in Vietnam. She has been featured in Forbes, Time Magazine, and the Wall Street Journal. So welcome to the podcast, Jennifer. Kelly, it's my delight to have a video podcast with you. Very, ex- <laughs> very exciting. So glad to have you. Absolutely. Well, let's, as you know, we start our interviews by getting to know our interviewees a little more. And so I have a couple of quirky questions for you. The first quirky question is, what is your favorite guilty pleasure television show? Ha. Ah. Well, I would have to say my guilty pleasure. I watch. I wa- have to admit, I watch a lot of TV. I love TV, but is uh, probably The Voice. If you oh. could consider that a guilty show, I mean, I could get hooked on that. I'm absolutely amazed at the talent that is out there, Kelly. And I love when they turn their chairs around and you get the suspense. It's I could watch that, and I must say, Shark Tank is up there too. <laughs> well, as, as an so, entrepreneur, I'm sure <laughs> that too. absolutely, right, yeah, right. yeah. There's a lot to choose from these days, right? There is, there is. Although it seems like they're never on like staggered. They all are like on at the same time. That you know, I want to watch one thing, and then there's nothing on for you know days. Yeah, but that's yeah. easy though. Now you can just uh, you know watch it any time, yeah, right? Netflix, we have a lot Hulu, of options. Yep, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Our next. Uh, Oops, I think. I think you just went out for a second. Oh, there you are. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, a little blip in the in the atmosphere. There we go. So our next quirky question is: Tell us something surprising about yourself that most people don't know. Well, I'm going to bring something up that will also tell people probably how old I am, <laughs> and the, <laughs> and this is something that uh, it was an event that was very uh, fam- a famous time in in our history, in the United States, at least in rock history, and I was actually one of the people that was at Woodstock. No way, I did not See? know that. See, Kelly, you didn't know that about me. Now, the funny thing I will say is that I'm kind of a wimp. So when it really started raining, my friends and I left after a day and a half. And my husband to this day just kids me about that. He says, you didn't stay through the mud. I said, well, some of the mud. It was, it was a real experience. Well, we have more time, I'll tell you about it, if I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> that is really cool, though. And for you younger people out there, that was an event, 1969, I believe it was. Yeah, they can <laughs> Only Google kidding. It. I think most people have probably heard so. about it. I think you're right. I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And now to transition to a, a little more seri- serious yeah. question. Yeah. Uh, so what's a change or an innovation you've tried in the last six months that went way better than you expected it would? Well, it's still going. It's still in progress, Kelly. And uh, what I have been doing for the last, well, so let's see, um, probably eight years now is writing books and speaking. And uh, I felt like by the time the third book came out, which I was very happy with having completed, and I felt like it's making a contribution, The Genius of Opposites, I immediately thought, what's my next book? You know, I immediately went to that place of my type A personality. (laughs) (laughs) And it's also, um, I I like to produce, I like to create. But I really, I decided to to go against my better instinct and to slow down and to stop and to not think about that question at all. So I took about six months off uh, from writing, you know, from writing a book proposal. I still write, of course, because writing's like a muscle. So you want to keep that up. And I love to write. But, you know, I wrote blog po- posts and articles and wrote journaling and all that kind of stuff. And so I decided to step back, which was very different for me. And what's emerged from that is I've gotten real clear, much clearer about the book, my next book. And oh, really? it's going to be about women. And uh, I, but I wouldn't have been able to do that had I not done what I've learned from my introverted 
friends and colleagues and and people that I coach, and that is to stop and to go within and to get quiet and to let things percolate. So were you taking a lesson from some of your introverted friends? To... No, absolutely. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. You were, I, I'm going to let you finish because that's extroverts. <laughs> to cut off introverts, we know that, Kelly, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So I think that was absolutely what I've done. And I, I mean, I've always been uh, a person to, to go back to my center and to meditate and, but I can lose that very quickly. And I, the introverts that I've been writing about and living with, uh, so to speak, both in my home with husband Bill, as you know, uh, but also with uh, the people I've done research with and my clients um, have taught me and continue to teach me. I kind of need to be knocked over the head sometimes. <laughs> To uh, slow down, to go fast, you know, to really um, to stop and to think and to go within and to really, it's been very, very helpful to do that. And I, I felt, and things emerge then in that space. And that tends to be what happens when we allow the room for other ideas to come in and we have an intention to use our friend Tricia Malloy's uh, ideas, right, <laughs> about, you know, possibly what we're thinking about doing, then ideas come to us. And But we don't do that if we're continuing to do what I find extroverts do a lot when they're, um, particularly when they're anxious, which to continue to spin. Mm -hmm. You know, that part of ourselves that feels anxious, we have to keep doing, keep getting out there. And we can't let the creative ideas come in uh, and uh, percolate, as I say, unless we stop. We must stop and be quiet. And uh, it's very hard for an extrovert. Yes, definitely, definitely. Yeah, but now, so needed, so needed. So uh, the next book's ab about women. Is it about introverted women or is it uh, broader than that? Good question. See, I'm, I'm taking it slow, Kelly, so I'm doing a lot of research right now. So I'll be, I'm sure I'll be checking back with you. I haven't quite decided on the direction. I have written a proposal, but I'm, it's a work in progress. So I'm, I'm going a different direction in terms of how I'm producing this book too, which is fun. I'm, I'm doing, I had mo almost gotten to a formulaic kind of process on how I did the research and how I wrote it, and I wanted a break from that. So it's been kind of fun. So I will, that's to be revealed and probably pretty soon. Okay, very <laughs> cool. Yeah, it was probably not fair of me to ask. No, it's <laughs> fine. Are you kidding? Everything's game with us, Kelly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. So, well, uh, so maybe tell us a little bit about your background and the, some of the roles you've had and kind of how you came upon this. Uh, I, I know about how you came yeah. upon some of this, yeah. but for our, for our listeners, and, and Jennifer's got a little bit of an I'll, allergy. An allergy so. today. Yeah, I'm, I got that pollen getting in my nose. Um, yeah, so I'll be uh, sniffling. So thank you guys for putting up with that. I can't, I, yeah, I can't infect you. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> but, so how I got into yeah. sort of how I got into this area. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I um, you know, well you know and on the others some other people who I've uh, been been working with and friends over the years that I've been married now 43 years to an introvert, a real introvert, Bill. And so early on in our relationship, you know, I would be thinking like why is he not talking to me you know we'd come home from places where he was very social and he would just go to his cave as I called it and uh, not having the tools and the insights about and the understanding about introverts and extroverts until several years after my relationship uh, sort of grew with him um, I, I was very frustrated and so that I learned when I had that insight that he wasn't trying to make my life miserable but that was how my husband was wired that framework kind of came with me. So I, I worked in, um, in terms of my background, I, I started in education. I was uh, <clears throat> doing a counselor. I was trained as a counselor in the schools and moved from that into higher ed and then jumped over to business and college recruiting and placement. And um, then, that, then I transitioned uh, more into working in companies, doing leadership development, um, a lot of training and development, a lot of career coaching. Um, and I kept coming up with, you know, uh, uh, people, in particular one guy I remember was sort of a pivotal experience and he turned to me and I was doing a lot of management, you know, these intense five-day training pro where they used to have big budgets. Remember those days? <laughs> <laughs> We had the great food and we go to these retreat centers. I remember this one guy's working at GE and I was really with, with that company for several years. And uh, this one lovely guy named Keith came up to me and he said, I just, you know, I really 
liking this class, but I know that I'm never going to be a manager here. I just, I know. And I, I probed him. I was like, why do you think that's, because he seemed very competent and real sharp. Uh, but he said, nobody really, Jennifer, sounds like me or looks like me who's a manager. And what he didn't mean looks in the physical sense, he, sense, he meant really more of it as, as an introvert, as I probed. It was more of the quiet demeanor. He was calm. He wasn't bombastic. Um, he was very effective with his team, I later learned. Um, so I, I, that was really pivotal, that Keith and many other Keiths, you know, who, came, who I would come up uh, in terms of helping and supporting and realizing uh, at one point that it, it wasn't about them changing, and I write about this in Quiet Influence, it, it wasn't about changing who they were as people you know, at all. And, and, and really, but, but instead recognizing, A, what their strengths were as introverts, as people who charged up from within that were more internally focused, uh, and taking those strengths and using those to lead, not to stop trying to be an extrovert, because that's where the exhaustion was, you know, try to be that outgoing person all the time was absolutely exhausting. So, uh, yeah. So you mentioned uh, introvert <clears throat> charging from within. So can you talk a little more about introvert versus extrovert and, and kind of where those differences lie? Right, and right. How they manifest. Right. And I think a lot of people are familiar, a lot of our, your listeners or viewers uh, probably are familiar with now with assessments. You know, when I ask people, have you taken the Myers-Briggs? A lot of people raise their hand now. So people sort of have an idea about it, but, but really what it's about is about energy. And I like to think of it like a battery. It's like batteries are charged up either as an introvert internally, like going within, you know, as I mentioned before, taking that time to then emerge in the world again to interact with the world. But, but introverts must have that downtime, that time to be in solitude uh, in any form that that takes. It could even be just walking on the track in the gym, just being alone. Um, that's very important. And that's really the definition of an introvert. It's internal energy that they get sustenance from. And the extrovert is the, is the opposite, you know, battery that's charged up by other people, by the outside world, right. externally. Um, and that said, what we know now is that it is a scale. Think of it like a bell curve. And that most people are not extreme introverts. I always laugh. I say, except my husband. <laughs> <laughs> He's him and a few others. Um, uh, but I think most people really are not on the outliers. If you think of that bell curve, it's not. Uh, it's nice to have a video here where I can show it. <laughs> Maybe it's backwards. I don't know. But um, we got the outliers on either side. But most people are in the middle in some form or fashion. So we're not extreme. Like you, Kelly. I don't. I think you're more introvert, but not. Uh, you also are, have a lot of extrovert in you. Don't right. you think? Well, I've become more introverted, but I I definitely recharge by being around people. Although, you do. I, I do. Okay. I do. I do. Although, what were you saying? Although, although after a long day of training, <laughs> yeah. I do get, that does wear me out. Yeah, yeah like doing I, this now, it can be a little bit draining. Whereas that real extrovert would be like, yeah, bring it on. Let me go yeah. do an interview now after I trained all day. You know? <laughs> I think training is very enervating. I mean, it's extremely exhausting, yeah. too. Yeah. So, I mean, we all have our different limits. Right. You know? right. So I think that's the key is really knowing that. Now, other qualities that you might associate with an introvert in addition to that is uh, introverts are calmer. They tend to be just have a calmer demeanor. If you're trying to sort of figure out if somebody introverted, that's a clue. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always mean they're calm inside, but outwardly they are. Yeah. They don't show as much on their face as an extrovert might. You know, people have described it, although it's not very politically correct, they've described it as like a fur coat. So the fur is on the inside with the introvert. The extrovert is on the outside. You see it all, you know, whereas the introvert is more private. They right. keep it within. So, um, yeah. So uh, speaking of that, um, if, if an introvert is a little more private and one of the things we talk about on this podcast is giving people permission to speak, helping leaders empower their people, um, because we know that if people are engaged and they're involved, there's better business results for everyone right. and the employees more satisfied in work. But, but if a introvert is less likely to speak up, mm -hmm. how, how does a, how does a leader help engage that introvert so that they can benefit from their great ideas without, right. without making them feel too uncomfortable if, if that's, if that's an issue for them? Well, I think that's a great question. I think managers, whether they're introverted or extroverted need to number one, be aware 
uh, and, and take into account this dimension of personality when they're assessing their employees. As they get to know their team, one of the best ways to connect with an introvert is one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, I think you should do that with everybody right. when you're a manager. Spend some time, just like we say with our kids, we need to spend some one-on-one -on -one time, right? So they, we get to know who they are as people. And so introverts, by the way, really will value that one-on-one -on -one time. So it's, it's recognizing and acknowledging that whole demeanor, that whole um, aspect of personality. And, and introverts will really appreciate managers who do that. That's a, you're already one leg up if you do that. Um, another thing that successful in the research that I found with introverted leaders that, and that they do really well is they help their um, employees, particularly their introvert employees, prepare for um, opportunities for them to be showcased or like in meetings or just uh, in any kind of a situation where a project is involved. They, they, they give them a heads up because introverts like that time to think about it. Yes. And, right? Yes. So they give them that time. I, uh, I, I managed a team where we took the Myers-Briggs test, and uh -huh. I had this one employee who's very outgoing, but came back as an introvert, ah. and I, uh, I was very surprised by the results, but then uh -huh. when I reflected back, I could see what the difference was, and it's just what you were just describing. So if we, we'd be in a team meeting sometimes, and I would, uh -huh. I would say, Bill, what do you think about this? And his name was Bill, too. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, and he would say, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, was he not here the last <laughs> half hour? That, that, that doesn't even make sense, you know. Um, but then other times he would come to a meeting, and he would just have this brilliant idea that mm -hmm. just was way yeah. better than anything I had come up with and I like couldn't reconcile those two things and the mm -hmm. difference was putting him on the spot versus ah. giving him some time to mull things over and to think about it and that's where the brilliance came out yes exactly yeah. exactly and I think also just in terms of pacing with um the types of um day that you structure with with your introverts like if you're in an intense project it's really important to know that those folks need breaks. Everybody needs breaks mm -hmm. to think and to recharge. We know now, you know, it's good to stand right where we're working a lot. Um, to just really assess the environment, like a meet, an all an all hands on all day meeting. You know, people introverts really hate those because oh, yeah. they're just they're locked in a room and it's just like so intense. And we order in lunch and you know, but the, those kind of things can be shifted so the environment really is playing to the introvert temperament, again, to, to give them a chance to take a break, to, you know, not be so intense, yeah. um, you know, and this helps everybody. It's not just the introverts, yeah. but to be aware of, I, I call it an introvert friendly workplace to really, you know, have those, um, tools for instance, in brainstorming so that, you know, just another example, you're not just all throwing ideas up on the flip chart. Cause that's the, that really plays to the extrovert strength of thinking, you know, and, and just saying what's ever on their head, <laughs> you know, just boys, as one extrovert said, I, um, I download my ideas, mm -hmm. you know, just download, download. And so that really brainstorming on the flip chart, somebody's writing them down, who do you, whose ideas you think are going to get down there? The so extrovert, you actually, right. Yeah. And you so you're leaving out 40 to 60% of your, uh, of your group and the potential productivity of the team. Like you were saying earlier about results connected to results. So as you said, you uh, leaders, if leaders can help that introvert prepare, give them a uh, heads up ahead of yep. time so they have time uh -huh. to process and think about it before exactly. a brainstorming session, then that's where they're going to have better quality. Yeah, uh, yeah. And also, cons yeah, I'm sorry. Or whatever, whether it's yeah. a brainstorming or some other kind of a meeting. Exactly. And uh, right. So to, so to have the time to prepare. And another strength to, to play into for the introvert is ri their writing. Their time, again, taking the time, like you're, the guy you were describing, he'd probably do okay if you send him a couple of questions on an email. So, you know, I used to have this boss, uh, Benny, who would come in, partly, uh, this was always so frustrating to me because uh, not so much from the extrovert standpoint, <laughs> although I, I mean, I would have been happy to talk to him, but I could really relate to the introverts because he was in my space, hanging out there asking me my ideas. And on top of that, it was 445 and I had to get to daycare to pick up the kids. And I feel the pressure. So I think about that with the introverts is sort of like, you know, just like this is not get out of my space, you know, and <laughs> I'm, I need time to think about it. Don't you know, you're asking me what I think. And it's great to because you want that 
that time to bounce off. But we need to just have a balance. You know, it's important. You don't you don't want the introverts just hold up in their office all the time or if they're working remotely, never to call in. There has to be interaction. There has to be team work. Right. Right. But uh, but just have a balance. And as I say, I, I found that one manager, Chuck, said to me, you know, when I started implementing some of these techniques, Jennifer, what I found is it it, it benefited the whole project team. You know, the extrovert thought about things that, you know, everybody, the pace slowed down a little bit and we were able to come up with richer, more robust solutions. Nice. Very yeah. nice. Very nice. So you say that introverts uh, benefit more from having some time to write, that they yes. tend to want to mull it over and then spell it out maybe. So I would imagine um, organizations that have like a social enterprise kind of tool where uh, it's so mm-hmm. kind of like that Facebook, but within the business, yes. uh, they might that that might be a good place for ex- introverts to shine because yep. they they can be more thoughtful and when they add to that conversation, they're really putting a lot of great stuff. But it's in a public forum, yeah, so that other people can see their their brilliant ideas. Yeah, totally. You're getting to the other uh, another challenge that introverts have, which is to be. They use the term, I just got back from Germany, and one of the big questions people had was, well, how do we help introverts be more visible? That was the theme that kept coming up in all the sessions. Um, how can we as introverts be more visible? And to, a, a tool like you were talking about, I think, is a real asset. For, like you said, Kelly, people can have a, a, a presence and they don't have to be talking. And it's thoughtful comments. Um, I, I teach uh, quite a few classes online, and I'm just in, I'm amazed at what comes up from the introverts, you know, yeah, yeah, and and just you can tell they're more introverted just when you speak to them too, and and just the the comments are so full of depth and there's a lot of great dialogue going back and forth and that you probably wouldn't have if we, you were in a classroom like you're in today, right? Exactly, and, and I agree. I've, I, that's been my experience too. Uh-huh. Is that you get a little bit, you get more richness there if you're yeah. doing something online where people can can take some time to think about how they're going to say it. And writing is great for all of us. I found that that was one of the six key strengths in Quiet's, the Quiet Strength book that I identify when I did research on, you know, how do introverts make a difference? Like, what do they do to challenge the status quo, you know, to provoke new ideas, to inspire people? And, and of course, I said quiet time. Um, maybe I can just go through a few of them. The yeah, quiet, great. Yeah, the quiet time was the base of it. I mean, everything sprung from that you know, from that quiet time. That was where the creativity emerged from. Those were the, you you know, the very innovative ideas. And then people would go back to quiet time. That that was just like going back for recharging, almost like a, think of it as electric car, you know, I need that charge. And then out into the world again to interact and have conversations. And so the others were, um, were preparation, like we talked about, you know, like, that was really key. Once you've thought about things and you just prepare your position paper or you're, you're having a typical conversation with somebody, you know, and you're just a little nervous about it, you prepare your talking points mm-hmm. so you know where you're going with it and what your outcome is that you're desiring. Um, the, other, the other one was a listening, engaged listening. And introverts excel. These are all yeah. strengths that introverts have, right? Is it, to really listen in a way that we, you know, where they paraphrase, where they ask really fabulous questions to get people to, to share their concerns, particularly if you're trying to influence, because I connected um, introversion with trying to influence. So to influence people, you have to understand where the resistance is, right? You have to build trust. And that all happens in these one-on-one conversations. It doesn't, it's not like going into the, you know, break room or the staff meeting and just announcing you're going to change something it, you know we build these these up these conversations and you understand where people are pushing back where they're for you and then the next strength they use that builds on that is um is focus conversations where that's more of a give back and forth it's it's beyond listening it's sort of like um you know it's where i give you feedback you know we we do that a lot of speakers like we have a focused conversation i'm going to tell you really what i thought worked and what where you need to course correct, you know, and that's, that's influencing somebody. So we do, you do that. You manage conflict in those times with focused conversations. Um, you're not afraid to have those difficult conversations. A lot of introverts share with me that's a very tough thing for them to have to deal with conflict. I don't know if you have found that in your work as well, that 
I think people in general avoid it. Yeah, Do you that's, agree? that's what I found. <laughs> people, all of us yeah. hate it. <laughs> all of us hate it. Yeah. Right. Even the, ex- even the talkers, although sometimes the extroverts will bring it up. They'll provoke. Yes, you know? right. It right. may not be always done in the most <laughs> healthy way. way. Yeah, right. <laughs> or helpful. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, exactly. But introverts say this is a real issue. They get very, uh, and I think part of it is that they don't get the practice at it and have, haven't had a really positive uh, experience with conflict. The conflict is really, you know, what I talk about in both in the book, Genius of Opposites, the last book, that was a key piece of the process of introverts and extroverts getting along together is I call it bring on the battles. Mm. I mean, you have to be willing to say, this isn't working. We need to have this difficult conversation so we can get through it um, and not skirt around it. Because what happens is if you don't, obviously we know what happens. Things get worse. They don't right. get, get better. No. You know, they don't, they get, they don't be, magically. Uh, no, get <laughs> no. Particularly if you're working with somebody trying to get results, it, it just you it can only. It's like a wall. You know, the bricks just keep getting higher and higher. So, um, so that was another one. The uh, the focus conversations. I talked about writing, so that would be like the the fourth one. I think. Come on. Um, and uh, what was what was, was the next the fifth one? one. That was the fifth one. What are we? You're keeping track so, of me. Uh, we got the quiet time preparation, right? Uh, engaged listening, focused conversation, writing, writing, and the last one, writing. Writing. I will add to writing a little bit too, because the way I found introverts use writing um, that I mentioned earlier when we spoke about journaling, mm-hmm. I do that a lot myself. They use writing not only to to present their point, so like you've talked to people. You've gotten their feedback. You're, let's say you're trying to make a change in your organization and you want to put forth a proposal. So you've gotten all that data from right, these conversations, from hearing, from surveys, whatever you're taking in. And then you actually um, make a, you take a stand. You make a position. You take a position. Um, in project management, I think they call it a straw man or something. Mm-hmm. They put it out there, mm-hmm. right? Get reaction. Um, so you put it out there, and uh, what they do with writing is they also write to get clear on where they stand. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the journaling part is like it's it's. I use a process called free writing when I write my books. So I just kind of get dump it out, you know. And they, I get I get more insights into that, mm-hmm. into where I'm at and what my position is. Yeah. And so introverts um, and get it from their head to their paper, and that's why so many writers, and I would say ninety five percent of our print reporters. Are uh, are introverts? Oh, interesting. That's yeah, it's interesting because you get it out and you you're internal, but you get it out on paper um, or on the computer. Right, right. And then the sixth one is uh, thoughtful use of social media. Okay. And and they don't they don't just post willy nilly like they you know may may choose a platform to be visible on like LinkedIn or you know like you were mentioning Facebook. Uh, I'm I'm seeing more introverts use Facebook, but a lot of them like Twitter because. Um, you, again, you can you can learn a lot. You could take your blog posts and put them on there. So it's just being being uh, strategic about how they use it, and it's a great way to promote your brand to in a, do it in a way that's not you know pushy, mm-hmm. um, and also engage with people without having to necessarily talk to them, right? <laughs> I mean, verbally, right, right, right. You know. Well, so uh, social media and thinking about kind of getting out there uh, reminds me of an, another question I was curious about with you. Uh-huh. Um, I, I think that uh, one way that we can connect with people is to be willing to, to share some of our own personal stories. And, and I don't necessarily mean, you know, the thing that makes you right. sob and lose control, but, but even just share some personal stories about how you learned lessons about why you believe things that you believe um, or the way you work, why you work the way you yeah. work, or um, some things that have influenced you in your life. Right. Is it is it harder for an introvert to to be open to share some of that more personal information um, than than say an extrovert? And if oh, I don't think so. You don't, I don't think, think it's so. harder? No, not not in a, it depends on the context. Um, two things I think. Uh, privacy, as I mentioned before, is valued by introverts, but it's really also about over time, as you get to know somebody, you know, they go deeper with their relationships. I'm, I'm generalizing now, of right, course. Right, right, right. But a lot of introverts, you know, you'll say it in the beginning, it's like, I don't know that guy at all. You know, I can't read him. He's hard to read. Right. And then finally, you get to work with somebody over time. Like, let's say you're managing, you have a lot of managers on the show on the, who listen. Uh, 
you get to know somebody and you realize how deep they are. And that's by uh, that person revealing something about themselves. In assertiveness training, we used to call it um, free information that you're giving free information about yourself. And it helps people to know you and to know, understand more how to interact with you. So no, I don't think, I don't, I think the privacy thing can be a slower ramp up to share. But I also would say, Kelly, you're, you have a performance background. So you know that a lot of um, people like we know uh, in our organization and speakers world are, are introverted. But what they do is that they do is so beautifully when you say it's harder, they take the skill, again, taking their strength, to prepare and craft a story gotcha. that is so well done. Yeah. Gotcha. Right? Right. Instead right. of winging it. Because the extroverts <laughs> could get up there and they could just tell stories and you're like, wow, you know, they have the gift of gab. But if you really look at some of those stories that are well crafted, they're a whole different level. Right. 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 With the punchline and just like really hitting home. Right. And uh, so that preparation really comes in strong in those gotcha. stories. Yeah, for gotcha. sure. Gotcha. For sure. Right. And so you would definitely encourage them to, to when they get comfortable, to, to open up. Or would you even encourage them to open up even a little sooner than they might be comfortable? Yeah, I think, I think open up a little sooner just because – I think looking at it from the perspective, particular, I'll, I'll take the context. We're talking generally now, but let, let's talk where I hear a lot of frustrations is in the realm of networking. And I wrote about this in the first book with the introverted leader. Sorry, I keep wiping my mouth. I'm like, <laughs> oh my God. Just tell me. <laughs> you know, I do that when I do speeches anyway, even when I don't have an allergy or a cold. I'm like, it's, so it must be like, but today I'm doing it more. So I see myself on the screen. Um, so uh, what was I talking about? I can't remember. Uh, See, that's an extrovert. So it's like, woo. <laughs> Encouraging but, them to be uncomfortable sooner and, and, and sharing. Yes. Oh, networking. And, I was yeah, talking about. Networking. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, that's a content, that's a scenario that I found. It, it just creates anxiety for introverts and extroverts. And where the frustration is for introverts, I'll say first, is that, um, well, obviously it, it's anxiety producing to walk into a room. You don't know anybody, you know? And so, um, and then to start sharing about beyond, you know, talking about the buffet or the speaker or some very sub, I call it small talk, but you, you know, you go to these events to not just, you know, show up, although you have to sometimes just do that to make a facial, right. To show your face, they call it. Yeah. But like, why waste your time and not try to get the most out of it, at least right. to get to know a few people, right. you know, or learn something. So again, back to preparation. Coming in with a couple of key questions, you know, so what have you been up to lately? Preparing, to your point, like, let me think about what have I been doing? Like, let me take a little inventory. What have I been interested in? Like, well, I just got back from Germany. I can talk about that. Um, you know, I, I've just finished my kitchen. I'm excited about having a new stove. <laughs> it doesn't have to be work-related. In fact, it's better if it's not work-related. Right. Because then it makes you, as you say, more real. Yeah. Well, you said something like that. You can connect and know people right. that way. Right. And that's, we do business and we, we get work done through knowing people and with people that we know, you know, connect with. Exactly. So that's, and so that's the frustrating thing for introverts. But then when they realize, and I do a lot of exercises about like this in my training classes and my speeches, when you know that you can prepare and you can come into those more confidently with a few talking points mm -hmm. in your head ready to go, right. some people even practice a lot, um, it's just, it makes things go better. It's never going to be comfortable for any of us, but right. it definitely is better. Have you found that with networking, that if you do a little thinking through ahead of time, no, you're I was better? Just, I was just taking notes. I'm like, I need to do that because I always get that question. So what's what's new with you? And I'm, I always like, uh, <laughs> never yeah, 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 yeah. So, it's a good yeah. thing to do on the car on the way over. I try to turn the radio off and just think. And then it's not just what's new with me. This is the key. It's got to be also, what do you want to know? So like right. you're there to learn and to grow and to develop. So, you know, like, you know, my daughter, she's just asked me, do you have any ideas about going to Europe? And she's asking me about some resources. And I'm thinking, okay, that's something in my head right now. And I'm trying to think about things, you know, that I could help her with, like some ideas. Mm -hmm. So I'm, that's something I might throw out at a thing. So do you know, anybody know any film schools over in Europe? Have you ever heard of it? You know, it's like maybe nobody has. It's like, well, you know what? This person might know somebody. Right. So, um, but you can also think about things that you want to know for yourself that, you know, uh, for your work. Like I, you know, I heard about this National Speakers Association. I'm thinking <laughs> about speaking more. 
you know, I'm not sure. Do you know about Toastmasters? Do you know about any of those places or you, that kind of thing? So you, and again, these people might not know anything, but typically somebody knows somebody. Right. Right. Who right. they could say, well, let me, let me connect you with my friend on LinkedIn who I know does speaking. So if you ask the question, usually you're going to get some kind of help with that. Well, so, people like to be I, helpful, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Even if they don't know the answer, they like to be helpful. <laughs> Especially us mothers and grandmothers, right, Kelly? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> That's what keeps us going. That's so, right. But I'll, I'll just finish that circle with saying that the extroverts are frustrated. I mean, I'll just say this because they're so comfortable doing, you know, talk, talk, talk. They say that it's very tiring for them. Because you're going back to your question, you know, do we, introverts need to share more? You know, do they need to tell stories? Yeah, may, give, give a little. To, they say, look, give me something. Like I leave these events and all I've done is ask questions. Like my husband, Bill, who's so introverted, just retired as a professor. And he used to complain to me even about his colleagues because he said they didn't talk at all. So he was the one that was Mr. Sociability. He says, this is exhausting pulling teeth for an introvert, but it's also for extroverts. Right. So I think it needs to be more of a give and take. So you feel like you're in exchange and it's not just in networking. It's also at work. You know, it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. in the workplace. Right. Uh, so I think all of these skills can be really helpful. Again, understanding what our temperament is, introvert, extrovert. There's, as we know, there's other dimensions. You know, it's one pair of glasses, right. Right? right? right. I mean, we look at gender, we look at age, we look at ethnicity, culture, on and on and on. And just sort of having those filters in our head to, to better understand somebody is very powerful. Absolutely. And people will appreciate that you are at least trying to make an effort, right, Absolutely. to speak their language. Absolutely. Very good. Very good. Okay, cool. Um, so we, we, you, you mentioned that there are plenty of uh, introverted leaders, too. We, we know sometimes the extroverted leaders get a lot of the attention. Um, right. and, you, and you mentioned several things that, several strengths of, of introverts. Uh -huh. Is there anything additional that introverts need to consider in those leadership kind of roles? Well, I think what I, what I did with the introverted leader is I really f took a look at what makes those people successful who are introverts in a world that very demands them to be out there and on stage so much of the time. And I said, what were some of the things that they told me? So I interviewed a lot of people who were deemed introverted and, and who had been also deemed successful um, in their fields. And it was a wide range of, of people. And that's the process I use for all my books. Um, and I kept coming up with the same kind of um, things that they did, steps that they took. And so I, I put that into this process called the four P's that you're familiar with, Kelly. I, I kind of pulled that out in the first book. And, uh, you know, and these, these were common, um, common steps that they took throughout their lives. Again, not to change who they are, but to become better at what they do and to also do some flexing because they have to flex as introverts. So the first step, what's the first step? Prepare. Okay. I, Sound familiar? Uh, <laughs> again, we keep knocking right. on the head. That's important. Um, the second thing they did was to be present. So once they prepared, uh, well, again, public speaking, networking projects, managing others, um, then they're in the moment. That's what we got the feedback all the time that the best leader I had to, was with me. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were there in the moment. They weren't worrying about the past, weren't thinking about the future. They were listening to what I was saying. They asked provocative questions. They supported me because they were with me, both mm -hmm. physically and mentally. Mm -hmm. um, and some people might even say spiritually, but anyway, they were there um, in the moment. And that was really key. And then once they were trying to develop a skill, then they went to the third step, which was really to stretch and to push. That The third, third P is push. And um, I always, um, you probably, you may have remembered the story I told about Jeremy, who was an, a, a rising introverted leader, a young man in my uh, local UPS store where I used to get my mail. I still do, actually. And, and he told me he was so pleased to be able to be taking this class in public speaking. And uh, he said it to me with his head down. He said, Jennifer, I know you'd probably be happy I'm taking it. He, he was an IT major. And I said, Jeremy, that's fabulous. You're going to be able to you know, sell your programs, have confidence. And he said, yeah, and it's online. He was so happy because it's <laughs> online. 
<laughs> yeah, I laughed too and thought. But, uh, but, you know, for Jeremy, I always make that point that he was, he was pushing himself. Mm. That was such a stretch for him. That was a push. That was a push. Yeah. He went on to be very successful, actually, in a, in a IT company. And, uh, but, but it really did take him at that point. That was his next step. For each of us, we have our own, you know, our own uh, right. barrier of entry. What do they say? Entry, entry barrier, um, depending on where we're at in terms of a skill or a strength. Right. Um, so I had another manager who to push herself, she came in in the morning and she actually made eye contact. I, I forced her to, I said, you need to do this. You need to try it. Yeah. Eye contact with two of her staff because she used to walk by the cubes and just not look at anybody. Oh, wow. okay. And then she, oh, slowly over time that changed and she could actually talk with them a little bit. The door started open. They started coming in with their problems and their concerns and their sub- questions and their team became stronger. It just starts with these small changes. Right. And she then kind of adopted that. Does she still love it? No, she still doesn't <laughs> like it. But, you know, she knows that to be an effective manager, she needs to mix it up right. and not just go in her office all the time where she would rather go. Right. She's lucky to still have an office, right? <laughs> she's, she's one of the rare ones. And then the fourth one is to practice, to continually to refine mm. your skills. Mm-hmm. And I think that... Um, that is one of the things that comes up a lot with introverted leaders. They'll say that nobody in their organization believes that they're introverts. <laughs> it's like, there is no way. They'll fight them. I'll say, you are right. not an introvert. Like, why are you even saying that? They say, no, I'm a very strong introvert. I, I, you don't realize how much I need time to re-energize right. and recharge. Right. They said, I'm very strong. But what they've learned is they have developed it like a muscle. I was talking about writing. Mm-hmm. They, you know, they use that other hand if you're ambidextrous, right? <laughs> or you, they become more ambidextrous. Let me put it that way. So if they're a right-handed person, think of their left hand as their extroverted side. You know, right. they're using it. They're using it. They're using it. Will they ever be an extrovert? No. But they develop that strength. Right. And they become a more uh, effective manager that way because they can flex. Very and isn't that true for all of us? I mean, the Absolutely. better we get at crossing that, I talked about that bell curve with sort of the line in the middle, you know, introvert, extrovert, it's a scale. As we practice these skills, we become much more of a whole person. And that Carl Jung, who uh, was the sort of founder, he came up with the term of an introverted person. That's what he said. He, that was his def- term. He was a psychologist in Vienna around the time of Freud. And... Uh, he said that in the second half of life, he was saying 50 and above, we develop the other side, become strong. Interesting. Not that we change, and but I think if we think about it, as you think about aging, you do tap into that, like you were mentioning earlier, weren't you? And and I do fall into that <laughs> after fifty uh-huh. that after fifty group. So uh-huh. that, that is uh-huh. interesting. So it is interesting, yeah. and it's pretty cool to say that we can. Even though we're born into this sort of type, mm-hmm. you know, the environment affects us like everything else, nature and nurture. Uh, but we get stronger at those skills. And so we can really adapt to different circumstances. Right. Uh, but it's still important to know our true nature. Right. You know, right. because I coach a lot of people who, um, who have been playing this extrovert role or vice versa for a long time. And, and they just, when they can get out of that, they just feel so free because mm. they've just been sort of playing and yeah. it's, it's tiring. Yeah. It's a very tiring place to be. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. Well, well, your new book is the, the, the your newest book is the, yeah. the Genius of Opposites. So what tips would you have for leaders uh, to take advantage of the genius that comes from people at, at different ends of the spectrum? Well, I, you know, it's interesting. I, the, the group, Penn and Teller, you know, Penn is the talkative one. Uh, Teller is the quiet, never says a word. He really does speak, but, you know, they're out <laughs> in Las Vegas. And he said this, the, it's like flint and steel when he looks at their relationship. And it sums it up, I think, for other genius opposites. He says it, it's like, you know, we, uh, we're better because of the sparks. You know, together uh-huh. is what makes it work. The fire doesn't happen without the flint and the steel together. So is that what you were talking about, uh, bringing on the battle? The That's a part really? of it. Oh, yeah. They said that they always fight. Yeah, they're definitely a good example of that. <laughs> I have a lot in the book. Siskel and Ebert, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but what happens with these these uh, 
partnerships, particularly in the introvert extrovert dimension, is that they they start out okay. You know, the opposites attract, right? You know the Paul Abdul song. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, I remember that. <laughs> right? But over time, you know, those traits that we uh, thought were so endearing, they can drive us crazy. Right, right. You know, like the calm, quiet Bill. <laughs> I'll go back to Bill, you know. It's like, why didn't you say any something? Why, you know, why aren't you answering yeah. me? You know, it's like, you're so calm. Are you really that calm? You know, I mean, we get, and we get like that with people at work as well. Yeah. So um, that's, so it's just like, well, what's the difference? What makes these partnerships really work so that they can sustain these relationships. And it's not so much about how they get along. The real key, Kelly, is what are the results they get? Because mm. it is about results. What? Because I do believe if we get two people together who are so different, we, if we can harness that, then it's so much more impactful what we, comes out on the other end. And, and the partners that you looked at, too, did they feel like they were better off because they had that opposite that, yes. that played off of them? Yeah, but not without work. It's like a marriage. Mm. It takes work. Mm -hmm. And they did not deny that at all. And they said sometimes those people drive them crazy. Mm -hmm. But that's okay because it's worth it. And they know how to, they know how to navigate it. Yeah. Like one, two people I'll talk, uh, I'll just mention briefly were a consulting pair, Maureen and Mark, and they were ex they're extremely difficult. They're v different. They're very successful. They work in Virginia, um, and they have just a, a strategy they use, which is a verbal shorthand. So when one of them is like the extrovert, Mark is like going off and off and off. You know, he says, well, "Let me go on a tangent." Like he'll just say that phrase. You know. Um, and, and they have other phrases they say to each other and sometimes even signals. I had somebody who looked at. So it's like, okay, that's a shortcut, you know, to, yeah. to get us back on track. But right. it's little things like that. Um, but it's also um, other strategies that, are, that take time and take effort. Yeah. But, um, but I didn't want to make it difficult. I wanted to say, well, what are the things we can do to keep it moving forward? Right. You know, so, so we don't uh, implode. <laughs> right absolutely because uh, we were talking about the conflict sort of building up so the first uh, I, I actually did again a model you know me with my processes <laughs> so this is a b c d e and this is in the genius right. of opposites so a is accept the alien <laughs> <laughs> little tongue in cheek uh -huh. and that's that really took me a long time to learn with my opposites mm -hmm. uh, that until you accept that you're not going to change them you're just going to be frustrated and stressed out so no, you're not going to change them. It right. just relieves things. And then you can sort of just go on with the program, you know, because don't try to change them into something. Right. Not. Right. That's really critical. We've learned that both being in marriage, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> Sometimes easier said than done, but we spend a lot of energy doing that, expecting, or even if they, we're not telling them that, we're expect. why don't they do it this right, way? Right, right. We're thinking it. We're spending a lot of energy. So B is bring on the battles. I mentioned that earlier. It's like, you know, really uh, facing conflict, looking at it as something to embrace and not to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. uh, embrace, uh, you know, not staying there, but to really be willing to take a look at when we're not, when it's not working and to talk through it. Yeah. You know, yeah. because that's when we get the better ideas. We know that creativity comes that way, and you know, it's just a really important thing yeah. uh, to to do. Um, and and bring on the battles is what I called it. And and I I always laugh about you know we a lot of us travel a lot, and uh, you know we wouldn't be on our airplanes today if it wasn't for the Wright brothers. Right. Now the Wright brothers were at each other's throats all the time. They were fighting, and they're the people that work for them were just couldn't stand it sometimes because <laughs> one would argue a position the next one would come back next day the other brother would come back and argue the opposite position but it was all to get to the best solution mm, mm. and then they would be fine yeah you know and now those were brothers too you had that dynamic <laughs> right but you think about it that you know I, i'm doing some work with nasa now and going i'm studying about how you know things work on the space shuttle and all these missions that they have and they must have conflict i mean we know the the terrible consequences of not facing right, right. disagreement from the two different incidents that happened, yeah. Columbia and the, and the Challenger. Yeah. I mean, on a grand scale. But um, with these partnerships, I mean, facing conflict is so, so important. Bring on the battles to talk about yeah. what's going on yeah. and to have ways 
in which you can manage through it. And understanding, for instance, the energy of an introvert I mentioned early, and and you know not and kind of taking breaks, mm-hmm. uh, that sort of thing. There's other. I have a lot of tools in the book, and then C is cast the character, and that's putting the right person in the right role, and uh, and that really serves the client, but it really helps bring out your best. Um, and I love the this the term in there. I think it was the quote by Hall and Oates. And, uh, and Oates is the, um, I believe he's the introvert. He talked about you can't have a sunrise without the horizon. And, and he, was the, he was the side man. He never really spoke up that much or sang that much. He was kind of on the side. The other one took the, the grandstanding. But that's, they, no, not one person tries to take the credit. You know, there is a shared sort of mm. ownership of the results. And that's really important not to have to grandstand like that. Yeah, yeah. So casting the character. And sometimes what they'll do is they'll flip roles. Like, you know, I, like you're always with the customer. Well, let me try it this time mm-hmm. so I can grow. Gotcha. But they talk about it. Right. You know, they talk right, about it. Right, right. And right. then the D is destroy the dislike, which is kind of a funny way to say to act like friends <laughs> and respect each other. Like you don't have to say act like friends. You don't have to be best friends. But you know how we've all been worked in a lot of companies and you know how you go into some organizations, I can think of, of one here that makes, uh, I shouldn't say, well, anyway, they're a very famous organization that we drink their drink, <laughs> Atlanta. And uh, I'm not criticizing the organization, I'm just saying it's a place that it was, you could pick up when I was there. There wasn't a lot of laughter, you know. I walked in the elevator, nobody saw, said anything and I was like, oh, I picked up the vibe at that point. That, and in some places, there isn't that camaraderie. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's like that now. But um, And you, when you have real production going on, you, a lot of times you have downtime. You have fun. You worked in IT. Right, right. There's a lot right. of pranking that goes on <laughs> in between the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that laughter is just so essential. Exactly. I had a, um, one of my partners at GE. Um, one time I came back from – we were co-leading a training class – and he had taken the masking tape, masking tape and put it down the middle of the table. Lloyd did. And because my stuff was all over like my desk is now. <laughs> real introverted and real structured and he liked everything in his place. So I came back and it was like that kind of broke the ice because we all laughed. It's like, oh, my God, he, this is the message he wants to send. He was just being funny about yeah, it. Yeah, you know? yeah. The whole class thought it was funny. And, and we sort of after that became best friends, you know. But uh, sometimes you have to laugh about your differences. Right, right. Do funky things like that to do. Sorry, we had a little technical difficulty, but we're all back now. So good. uh, So we we talked about destroying the dislike, having fun, and there was one more. Oh, oh, the last one, Kelly, is each can't offer everything. And that's uh, related to the clients and the customer. So knowing that together you offer this combination that's terrific of opportunities of different perspectives and clients really appreciate that. Even when you disagree perhaps about a solution, they get uh, two for the price of one and even more than two. (laughs) It's a combination. It's a whole mixture of ideas. And so you guys are all problem solving together. And customers and clients uh, will, and even prospects when you're trying to you know, sell to people will see that there's variety in the kinds of solutions that you're offering because the two opposites bring different viewpoints. And I found that happen time and time again. So, so. it's like a multiplier effect. Thank you. That's the word. Exponential. <laughs> right. Buzzwords are us. <laughs> <laughs> That's All funny. right. Well, I just had uh, one last question for you yes. then, and then uh, to open it up to anything else that you wanted to add. But um, on this journey of becoming the champion of the introverts, uh, what have been some of uh, I love your, fa- your, your body language. <laughs> it just sounds so like superhero-ish. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, it does. Okay, I like that. Uh, okay, but, but in that journey, what have been uh, one or two of the most pleasant surprises that you've come uh, across? Uh, I love it. Um I, I would say one of them has been the opportunity, Kelly, to travel the world and see every place from Australia to my recent trip to Germany and open up the dialogue about this important topic, um, to really talk with people about what it means to be introverted and uh, why we need to pay attention 
to over half the population, <laughs> you know, or at least half. And um, it's been a fabulous experience for me to be able to travel and to, to work. So that's been incredible. Um, I think also um, just tapping into, I mentioned earlier, tapping into uh, the side of myself that's quieter, that's got the, uh, the ability to really reflect and go deep has been a real gift. And I, I know that that's part of the reason I've been on this journey. So um, those are, I would say those are two of the surprises. And the third one, since you're, you asked for a few, right? <laughs> I'll try to squeeze that Okay, in. okay, go for it's it. It's just the feedback from people that mm. it's really touched them to be able to validate uh, who they are and to be heard. Uh, nice. And that's particularly the introverts. Well, and people, all, all people want to be heard. All people exactly. want to be heard. Yeah, exactly. very good, very good. Well, is there any other words of wisdom that you might give our leaders that are listening to this um, in our closing here? Well, I think the only thing I would suggest to leaders is that they pause. And, and they pause because I'd like them to listen to themselves and tap into their own strengths and own those and pause so that they can hear everybody who they work with and try to get the best out of each of those people. So that would be my, I guess, words of, words of, <laughs> if we call it. I don't know why I'm putting it in a quote mark. And, you know, I'd love people to, to visit my website and jenniferconwire.com and maybe you can put some of the information yeah, Kelly on there yeah, for sure fabulous will. We sure about will. you know so we can continue the conversation uh about this important topic absolutely so. yeah we'll definitely put the the link to your website and the link to your books in the thank in the you show notes. absolutely yeah okay, appreciate well, it. jennifer it's always a delight hanging out with you so thank you so much for, for here, joining Kelly. us and for sharing your words of wisdom many 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 words of wisdom for our audience yeah. It's been, I hope it's been helpful and I, I've really enjoyed my conversation with you tonight. So thank you. Thank you so much. Take care, Jennifer. Thank you. This podcast was brought to you by Bigger Brains, online training that won't bore you to tears. Expand the minds of your workforce at getbiggerbrains.com. Thanks for tuning in to Permission to Speak. If you want to increase collaboration and innovation in your organization, check out more resources available at speakingpractically.com or give me a call, Kelly Vandiver, at 770-597-1108.